Welcome to Bottom Line Experts Live webinar series. Tonight's webinar is delicious diabetes dinners everyone will love with our expert Linda Gassenheimer. You know, people come home from the doctor's office with the news that they have diabetes, and then they wonder, what can I eat? What do I have to give up? They're just totally lost. Well, the good news is that you can eat lots of delicious dinners like the one that's pictured on this slide. In fact, there are many things that you can actually eat. A diagnosis of diabetes does not mean a lifetime of only grilled fish and steamed vegetables. I'm Sarah Heiner, publisher of Bottom Line Publications and your host for tonight's webinar. Bottom Line Experts Live is so pleased to bring you delicious diabetes dinners that everyone will love, a webinar that will give you the guidelines and tools you need to make healthy dinners that you can proudly serve to everybody that's in your house. We have a lot of great information for you tonight. And in fact, you'll have a chance to answer some of your questions during tonight's Q&A section at the end of the webinar. So if you have a question, just look on the left side of the screen, and there's a box there. And you can submit a question at any time during tonight's presentation. We'll try to get to as many as we can. And if not, we'll can answer some of them later on and through emails or on our website. Now, here's the big question. Why on earth are we talking about dinner? Well, because if you think about it, that's really our main meal multifaceted, multi-flavored, the, the fullest plate of the day, the day, right? Well, we want savory dishes and we want a mix of flavors and meals that fill us up but they don't stuff us up and those that set us up for a relaxing evening. But, you know, we need to do this seven nights a week. And let's face it, in America, cooking seven different and interesting meals each week can sometimes be a big challenge. Well, that's why I'm thrilled to introduce you to Linda Gassenheimer an award-winning cookbook author and Cordon Bleu trained chef. Linda's known for creating delicious, healthy recipes that are easy and quick. And she's the author of more than 20 books, including Mix and Match Meals in Minutes for People with Diabetes and Fast and Flavorful Great Diabetes Meals from Market to Table, both of which are published by the American Diabetes Association. So without any more delay, I'm going to hand it on over to Linda. Well, thanks, Sarah. It's great to be with you and to share this information. Now, we're going to talk about how people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes can enjoy delicious, and I'm talking mouth-watering because my mouth is watering right now thinking about it, dinners. Now, many doctors and diabetes educators might talk to you about what you should be eating, but when it comes to actually buying and putting dinner on the table, you're largely on your own. And in fact, Sarah, I took two doctors to the supermarket, and I said, okay, buy ingredients for dinner and they did not know where to start. That's unbelievable, well, that's, right? Well, that's it. That's where I come in. And I'm going to help you get your meals on the table and in minutes. Okay, so I'll teach you the tricks of the trade from home-cooked meals, some basic meal planning guidelines for people with diabetes, and they're based on recipes that my readers love. So they've already been tasted, tested by other people. Well, and not only that, Linda, we are going to be sending those recipes to everybody that's listening here tomorrow morning. So oh, at the end, we'll, we'll explain how they're going to get it. But tomorrow morning, they get all these delicious recipes. Wonderful. That's great. And realize, too, that these meals are just a healthy way to eat for everyone, not just those with diabetes. In fact, according to the American Diabetes Association, this healthy eating style is the way we all should be eating. All right. Now, listen, before we get technical here, because I'm starving and I'm all about delicious, so let's start with the delicious part of everything. What kinds of foods are we going to be talking about tonight? Okay, look at this. How about a variety of delicious meals, including a Vietnamese hot and spicy stir-fried beef. Yum! Which is on the picture here. Yum! And hot, hot, I'm telling you, the, the winner here, for me, is the hot glazed tuna steak with a pecan pizza. Uh, spinach salad. This is a 15-minute meal. And, and it looks more. so busy. That's what we said before, Linda. Like, this is easy to do and so creative. Very easy and, and, and delicious because if it's not delicious, forget it. So also, how would you like a fragrant lamb tagine? Or you might have thought that your days of eating a variety of rich flavors were over, but I'm going to tell you, not so. So first, let's talk about the thinking behind the meals. Since you or maybe somebody in your family has diabetes, think about foods that, that uh, the foods you eat. And you have to think about it in a new way. So what helps you is to understand how your body digests food. 
especially carbohydrates. That's important. And we'll, we'll help you know what to eat. If you are managing type 1 diabetes, it's important to match your insulin dose with the carbohydrates you eat throughout the day. So not all people with type 2 diabetes are on insulin. The information here about consuming a healthy diet applies to people with either type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Now, when you eat, now there's a picture of your stomach here. It tells you what's going to happen in your stomach. When you eat, your body breaks down the carbohydrates in your food so that can be absorbed into the bloodstream as glucose. Your body releases the hormone insulin, which helps the glucose enter the body's cell, so it can be used as energy. When you have diabetes, your body doesn't produce, produce enough insulin, or your insulin isn't used efficiently, leaving the glucose in your bloodstream rather than stored as fuel in your liver and muscles. And that's why you need to uh, take care to eat properly um, and have that steady flow of insulin. Now, notice I mentioned carbohydrates. Now, that's key here because carbohydrates are found in all food types, but especially in grains and baked, food, baked goods, fruit, and starchy vegetables like corn or beans. Those beans are the legumes or peas. Now, the amount of carbohydrates you eat can affect how much blood glucose rises in your body. That doesn't mean you have to avoid carbohydrates because you certainly can have them, but it depends on the amount. And it has to work with your own individualized meal plan. Now here, this, this is what's important. You have to make your carbohydrates count. Choose nutrient-rich foods rather than those um, less healthy sweets, like refined grains or salty snacks. So like all those things that were in that picture on the previous slide in the average American it, stomach, right? Exactly. You eat them, and that's fine, but they're... But then your insulin doesn't know what to do. They're digested quickly. And we're going to talk about that further on. So you're thinking, what, what are the healthy ones? What should I be eating as far as carbohydrates are concerned? And think of whole grains like brown rice and whole wheat bread and whole wheat pasta, uh, fruit, low-fat dairy, beans, which are the legumes, and, and some starchy vegetables. Now, one way to manage your blood glucose levels is to count your carbohydrates. That's really important. And my recipes are created with this in mind. So you don't have to do the counting. I've done it for you. That way, putting the meals on the table is easier. Just so you have the background, the American Diabetes Association recommends that you consume 40% of your calories from carbohydrates in each meal. Now, how do you know what that is? One example, if you had a 600-calorie meal, consume no more than 60 grams of carbohydrates. But that's 240 grams a calories from carbohydrates. So, you know, how do people know how many carbohydrates? Um, well, I'm here to tell you, you don't have to be a biochemist. First, for simplicity's sake, <clears throat> follow the recipes we're sending you and use them as a blueprint so you'll be able to eyeball all those portions. Also, later we're going to talk about a picture of your plate and what it should look like with the carbohydrates. Now, Let's talk about protein. We talked about carbohydrates, and we're on to proteins. Protein comes from meat, fish, some nuts, some beans, some dairy food, including milk and cheese and yogurt. But here's a, an important point. Protein does not have a significant effect on your blood glucose levels. It's the carbohydrates you need to think about. So proteins is one of the critical foods for all diabetics well, in a lot of ways, you, right? You, you want to have a balanced meal, so you need to have some proteins, and that's lean proteins like fish or chicken um, and even some low-fat meats. You can have ones that say loin, like tenderloin. Those are lower in fat, and that's what you want to cut back on, that saturated fat. So we're going on to talk about fats now. We've talked about the carbohydrates. We've talked about proteins. Some fats are better for you than others. I'm, you may have heard this, the good fats the monounsaturated ones, the ones that are like canola oil and olive oil, the easiest ones for you to find in the market, um, those are good. But saturated fats you want to cut back on, things like um, animal products or butter, or fatty meats, the real fatty meats. Now, it's recommended that people with diabetes try to con keep their consumption of saturated fats to as low as 7% or less. 
um, of their meals to limit those, and you want to limit those trans fats. And that's to lower your risk for heart disease. And again, how do you know what's saturated and what, uh, how, what do you know what 7% is? Look at my recipes and it'll give you the idea. You'll have a blueprint. Um, and um, they'll help you to understand what you really can eat. Now, we've mentioned eating well balanced meals that should consume, uh, that you should consume a combination of slowly digested foods that don't make your blood sugar spike, keeping your insulin flowing nicely. So here's a simple measure for you. I said that we were going to talk about uh, what's on your plate, and this is really simple. So here's your plate. Draw a line across the center, and then divide one side in half so that um, you'll have three sections. Now, the largest section is going to be half of your plate, and that's what you want to have is some non-starchy vegetables. And the smaller ones, a quarter of your plate, is whole grains, brown rice or whole wheat pasta. And the third section, is going to, a quarter of your plate, is lean protein. So what does that really look like as far as food is concerned? Well, here's a plate. that It really looks appetizing. It's full. It's colorful. And you notice the vegetable side of the plate you have a room for two servings of vegetables. You've got some vegetables, and then there's a salad there. And I, Sarah, I think that looks really delicious. I'm hungry right now. <laughs> I, doing this at dinner time is just killing me. But it's it looks fabulous, and there's a lot of food there. A it's lot of like, food. It's not like you're deprived. No, absolutely not. And it's tasty food too. So um, part of establishing the well balanced meal is knowing how your body is knowing your own body. And you want to know how it reacts to certain foods uh, in terms of raising your blood sugar levels. And everyone's different. People react differently to the same foods. Here's an example. I have somebody, you know, legumes and beans, we said that's a good source of protein. But one person told me that when he eats them, his sugar spikes because he takes his sugar right afterwards. So he knows that that's not something that he should be eating. Uh, for others, it's a very good source of, of carbohydrates. You will come to understand your own body and how it reacts to specific foods. How you can learn about your body and how it reacts, test your glucose levels before and after your meals. And after a while, you'll get to know, so you don't have to test it quite so often. Now, before we go any further, a word about weight. There's the word we all love. It's January. We have our, our resolutions going. I'm sure everybody's sticking to them, to the tree. Yes, we knew that, absolutely. Many people with diabetes are overweight, although not everyone is. And, of course, weight control is important. Being overweight plays a role in insulin resistance, and that's a condition where the body has a hard time using insulin to lower your blood sugar. The better your weight is controlled, the easier it is to manage your diabetes. Even people who are not overweight need to count their carbohydrates and watch their portion sizes. These are important. Everybody should. No, it doesn't matter. Big, small, in between, everybody should. Okay, but Linda, can we please, this is all great information, now can we get to all those tricks on how to cook their food? All right, so you want to know how to cook. All right, yes, let's do it. I want to get to that <laughs> delicious food. <laughs> so now that I know what my well. plate should look like. Okay. There are four main tools I use to make all kinds of really delicious dishes, and I'm going to give you those tools to help you make great dinners. And let me tell you something. If my dinners aren't great, my husband really lets me know. So that has to really take My husband's good. grateful when I cook him dinner. <laughs> well, he can talk to my husband. We'll deal, we'll deal with that later. <laughs> Many try to make versions of their favorite dishes by lowering the butter or cheese or high-calorie foods. But you know what? They never really taste the same. They won't have the same flavor memory. Uh, but you don't need to feel deprived. And I'm here to tell you to create your own flavor memories. Um, instead of, let's make, say you're making your old favorite, like mac and cheese, uh, you try to um, make that in lower fat and everything, and it's just not going to taste good. So develop a new kind of flavor memory. Develop something else. Here, here's a tip that I... Um, that I find is really delicious, uh, maybe you'd like to try it. Um, you buy some tomato sauce and make, make sure it's a low, um, a low sugar one, and you know, you're going to put it over about a half a cup of pasta. Um, and 
then you can add some fresh basil to it. Now, I add that basil right at the end before it's served, so it's nice and fresh and, and green looking. And here's my secret. I add grated orange rind, and that gives it a very unusual flavor, but it gives you a sweetness. And that sweetness um, will uh, take care of some of the acid in the tomatoes. And what an now, interesting combination. I think this is such an important point, Linda, that, you know, you don't feel deprived if you're developing new flavor memories. Of course. That's it's, right. Right? So that your old food, you'll never, macaroni and cheese, as you said, will never taste the same when you try to do it low-cal, low-fat way. But create all new flavors. And orange, orange rind and tomato, I can't wait to try that. Well, you'll be surprised how, what a difference it makes. And, and, but maybe you grew up eating vegetables soaked in butter. Um, but you don't have to do that, or maybe a cheese sauce. Um, how about sautéing vegetables in a little broth, and then add some a little bit of vermouth or sherry? That'll that'll set up your vegetables really nicely. That or you can toss very yes, toss your green vegetables with a little olive oil and grated Parmesan cheese. Or what I like to do is sprinkle some sesame seeds on top. Makes it nice and crunchy. Uh, this is so tasty that you won't miss that butter, cream or cheese sauce. Or maybe you could cook some carrots with a little nutmeg and star anise. That's an Asian flavor, and it's becoming really, really popular in Asian foods now. So just add a little bit to the water when you're cooking the vegetables. It will make a huge difference. You'll be surprised. Now, what are the two main ingredients that everyone uses in the kitchen? Okay, it's olive oil. If not olive oil, it's another, it's another kind of oil. And salt. And we usually cook with the oil or salt, and then we add it again, um, either at the table or just before serving. So here's my tip. It's all about the timing. So hold off using that olive oil when you cook. Um, either I, you can use a nonstick pan or use olive oil spray, or even maybe just one or two teaspoons of olive oil to get your recipe going. Uh, and then at the end, just before it's served, I drizzle olive oil on the top. That way, the very first taste you have when you take that first bite is going to be the olive oil. So you're using less, but you still have that flavor, which is really I think, great. I think that's such a great idea. It, you know, it really is, and, and, and try it. Try it because you'll, you'll see the difference. And do the same with salt. Um, you know, you don't need to add the salt to your boiling water for pasta. You're going to put some sauce on it anyway, the pasta. Add the salt just before it's served, and again, you use less, but you still enjoy the flavor. And here's another trick I have, spices. They can be your best friend. Now, you probably have about five, maybe seven spices in your kitchen that you use all the time. But go to the supermarket and look in the spice section. You'd be amazed. You'd be overwhelmed, actually. I did this the other day, and I thought, my God, it's getting bigger and bigger, that spice section. Uh, well, they it is, bring... and it's hard to even know where to start. Exactly, exactly. But they can bring the taste of food to life and rich flavors that keep you from eating the salt and the fat that you don't really need. Now, here's a few to start with. And Sarah, you said, you know, where do you start? How do you do that? Well, I like cumin. That's great. And I mix cumin with a little chili powder. And you mix that together. I can coat fish with it. Um, in fact, to be getting a recipe called Cumin Crusted Snapper. Um, oh, boy, I'm just thinking about that. I'm getting hungrier now. <laughs> and, and you're going to use fresh and use fresh herbs like mint. Now, you can uh, that flavors... Um, Lots of foods. You'd be surprised. It gives a nice, fresh spring flavor to food. And in my recipe, ginger mint chicken um, really brings out that chicken flavor. And again, you'll get that recipe. Well, and that so sounds you, so good. Here it is, the middle of January. That sounds so springy to me. Yes. And, you know, now you can get these fresh herbs in your supermarket all year round and use them. And let me tell you, when you're using the fresh herbs, you can put them in soups, salads, or if you buy a reduced fat salad dressing, um, put some fresh herbs in it. Bring out this flavor, overcooked vegetables. But again, put them in at the end, just before you're ready to serve, so they keep that nice, fresh, a uh, bright, a uh, bright flavor. So Sounds now great. let's let's oh, thanks. Let's talk about sweet. Now sweets aren't only for dessert, and I love sweets as much as anybody else, maybe even more. But it's not just for desserts. You know, a lot of the uh, dinner dishes have some sweet flavors in it. Um, and, for example, the glazed tuna we looked at earlier um, has a sweet glaze on it. 
And there's several ways to sweeten dishes without adding sugar or sugar substitutes. And that's important. You don't have to use sugar substitutes. Use a low sugar apricot marmalade for topping for grilled meat, chicken, or fish. And you look in your uh, supermarket, you'll find the low sugar spreads there. Um, a spoonful of honey uh, with an equal amount of Dijon mustard will make a sweet and tangy sauce for meat or vegetables. Uh, and also, you know, honey is good for you. It's a good source of vitamin B and niacin and thiamine and riboflavin. Uh, but again, use it in moderation. One tablespoon at a time and you'll be okay. Now, I mix the marmalade with some Dijon mustard. And I put that as a sauce for my hot glazed tuna steak. And then I add a little orange juice in the beef skillet one pot meal. That's from Fast and Flavorful. That's my book, Great Diabetes Meals from Market to Table. And all those recipes come out of that book, and you're going to be sent the ones I've mentioned. Well, before I go any further, let's just take a little review of some of these tools I've given you. All right, develop new flavor memories. Try that orange rind in the pasta sauce. Or remember the right time for olive oil and salt. Add it just before serving for that very first bite and burst of flavor. Now, spices and herbs, keep them on hand. They bring new flavor to your food. Try that mixture of cumin and chili powder. Uh, put it on your next chicken dish or fish dish. You might, you'll, I think you'll like it. And then sweetening savory dishes. Try that hot glazed tuna recipe that you're going to get. It's a family pleaser, and it's 15 minutes, so it's a, a cook's pleaser as well. <laughs> The time, the time and the delicious is just the perfect combination. All right, so listen, this is all great, those tools. It's simple, such a simple concept and yet can make such a big difference. So now let's talk about some of the specific foods because, again, people leave the doctor's office and they think all their favorite foods are totally gone. So can we go through a couple of foods, favorite foods, and they'll say, you know, can they eat it, can't they eat Can we play that little game? Sure, of course, because all I right. get those questions. Sarah, I get those questions all the time. Um, and here are some, most, some of the most common questions I'm asked. Okay. Uh, and if you, again, if you have any specific questions, you can submit them on the screen to your left, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So the first one, can I have a baked potato? Well, yes, you can have a baked potato, but it needs to be a small one. And I'll bet you didn't realize that when you go to the market and buy a baking potato, which is called a russet or an Idaho potato, that's an 8-ounce potato. It's a half a pound. So that's not such a good idea. But cut it in half, and you can have about four ounces. That four ounces has eight grams of carbohydrates. So, again, you need to know that because you're counting carbohydrates. And how big but is that? Eating... About the size of their fist? About that, yes. Um, but you're better off eating a sweet potato because it contains more nutrients. Uh, it's more slowly digested than a white potato. And you can eat the skin, which is really good. Awesome. Right, okay, next now how about pasta or rice? Okay, Everybody's pasta. favorite. Right. You want to have about a half a cup of cooked whole wheat pasta or brown rice um, per meal, and that's a serving size. And remember that the whole wheat and brown rice are more nutritious choices than the white rice or the white pasta. And I just want to tell you that they are now making a flour that looks white but has the whole grain in it. And so look for that because you can serve it looking white. You don't have to tell your family that it's good for them. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay, how about pizza, which is my personal favorite food. Someone says pizza, I'm in. You're in, and it's such an easy, quick meal for everybody in the family, especially when you're so busy at the end of the day. Well, you know, people are getting smarter. The people who are selling the pizza are getting smarter about it. So look for whole grain or even just a thin crust pizza. And if they have both thin crust and whole grain, it's even better. Now, stay away from the pizzas that have a very thick coating of cheese. You know, that cheese is so thick you can uh, cut it with a knife, really. Um, it's just got a lot of saturated fat. And remember, cheese has a lot of salt. So have one with some tomato sauce and vegetables. And again, watch your portions. Think in terms of two small slices uh, of a healthy pizza. Uh, just to put you in perspective, if you've got a 14-ounce pizza with everything loaded on it, I'll bet you can't, have, you can't guess how many calories it is. You probably don't want to know. But the, that's, <laughs> it's 2,000 calories. It's a whole for, day in a pizza. 2,000 for a 14-inch pizza. With everything on it. Whoa. Yes. All right. Moderation. Wait, wait, everything in moderation, right? That's before you drink with it, okay? All right, moderation. So now that's what, the next question. Okay, how get. about steak and pork? Okay. Yes, 
Definitely. If you saw the cover of my book, the first slide, it had steak, it had beef on the cover. Um, now, you want lean cuts of steak and pork. Uh, look for round steak in the market. Or as I mentioned earlier, tenderloin, pork tenderloin, beef tenderloin. Um, those are the ones with the less amount of fat in it. Um, and even better now, and <clears throat> you're finding that in most markets now, grass-fed meats, they're very nutritious, they're, they're um, eco-friendly, and they're much less uh, saturated fat in them. And, of course, you always can uh, augment your wheat with some fish and some skinless uh, poultry, um, right. which is, will be good for you. And, of course, watch those por portions. Think of a deck of cards. Exactly. Portion size, as we said. I can't say that enough, right? Portion size, right. portion size. All right. How about vegetables? Do they have to stick to just a, por just a deck of cards for vegetables? No, vegetables are good for you, especially the non-starchy ones. Think broccoli, spinach, zucchini, green beans, all the, the really green color vegetables. Um, and then you can have this uh, small amounts, acorn, squash, or, cor or corn, but just smaller amounts of it. Remember, though, all foods have calories. So we think in terms of a half a cup of vegetables for a serving. Uh, here's the question that comes up all the time. Drinking. Drinking. What can I drink with dinner? Well, of course, you can drink uh, water or calorie-free drinks, uh, but please stay away from the regular soda. And juice has a lot of sugar in it, uh, fruit punches or sugar-sweetened drinks. But the real big question is? Alcohol. How about alcohol? Nice wine with dinner? Yes. Well, it's best to minimize, of course, alcohol consumption. The American Diabetes Association recommends a limit of one drink a day for women and two drinks for men. Now, what is a drink? That's a five-ounce glass of wine or a 12-ounce glass of light beer or one and a half ounces of 80-proof distilled spirits. That's a one-finger level in a whiskey glass. Uh, but, yes, you can have it, but be careful with it. All right, so now, though, let me ask you this, Linda. How about those mixers that go with the, the spirits? And that's a great question, Sarah, because you have to watch that. A lot of the mixers are filled with a lot of sugar and all. So be careful with the mixers um, and, uh, you know, sparkling water or, or, or non-sugar sodas or what, that kind of mixer. Okay, but watch it with the mixers. All right, you ready to go on to those fabulous recipes now? All I bet everybody else is, again, too. All those, all those six <laughs> delicious recipes we're emailing tomorrow. Oh, so they're they going to have to wait till tomorrow? Do you think they'll make it to the night? <laughs> Waiting? They'll dream about it. They can dream about it. We have okay, to sleep these sometimes. These recipes, are, I have two books, you know, from the, um, uh, published by the American Diabetes Association. And one's called Mix and Match Meals and Minutes for People with Diabetes. And the other is Fast and Flavorful. Great Diabetes Meals from Market to Table. And that book is based on food you pick up in the supermarket and you can assemble at home. Okay, I have a question. Are those available? You have a website, dinnerinminutes.com. Are those books available on your website? Well, if you go to the website, you can click on the books. Um, they're available. Uh, um, it'll tell you where to buy them at, at Amazon, any online bookstore, or any, any local bookstore. Okay, uh, we're getting all sorts of people them. asking about what's Linda's website, what's Linda's website. So dinnerinminutes.com. All right, now let's get to those recipes. Okay. They have a great, I picked them for variety. There's, a, there's one for beef, there's lamb, there's chicken, there's pork, and a vegetarian dish. So let me whet your appetite. Vietnamese hot and spicy stir-fried beef with Chinese noodles and snow peas. I can barely say this, so I'm getting hungry now. Okay. A, a tasty blend of Pacific Rim flavors. It has lemongrass. Um, that's a great spice to use. Um, it's the most, one of the most important spices in Thai cooking. It's the secret flavor here in this beef recipe. All right, lamb and lentil tagine. You know, I just came back from a trip to Morocco. I had tagines and tagines. That's the that's the vessel that's cooked in, but it also means a stew. That's what it means. So you can have lamb cubes. They're blended with cinnamon and cumin. Uh, it's very fragrant for this Moroccan dish. Uh, and what you want to do is look for a tender lamb that has been cut for lamb kebabs. That and may help you cook spices, faster. 
there's so much research on cinnamon and cumin that they are just so healthy for you. So you're adding not only are the recipes healthy, but all these spices are adding even more healthful goodness. Exactly, exactly. And then you're going to have a ginger minted chicken with lemon and carrot barley. Uh, it's wonderful uh, if you're on the mood for Middle Eastern flavors. So this, these recipes are just packed with flavors from around the world. The chicken is marinated in yogurt and spices, mint and fresh ginger, and then it's broiled. And then some shredded carrots are added for a little crunch and texture. And again, each recipe, we're sending them, each recipe includes a shopping list, cooking hints, helpful cooking hints, and of course, your nutritional analysis, so you'll be able to count your carbs and know what you're eating uh, when you're putting together your own dish. Remember here, keep in mind some basic serving sizes, half a cup of grains, pasta and rice, a half a cup of beans and legumes, a half a cup of vegetables, one and a half cups uh, if you're having a one-dish meal, um, and uh, two tablespoons of a salad dressing or sauces. And how about protein, so, Linda, because we don't have protein in this list. How much should that people re um, consume You want to have... Um, now, you want to have about f three to five ounces of lean protein at a meal. So, um, and, and again, that's all listed in my book. You'll be able to know what it looks like. And we talked about a deck of cards. Yeah, I think that's a really good uh, And if you're a vegetarian, that, sorry? Uh, that's just a really good image. I always use that in my mind as a deck of cards or kind of my, the, the palm of my hand or fist or something. Just and for an, I said an idea. Right, somebody said to me once, well, my palm's small and my palm's big. Well, guess what? If your palm's big, you can eat a little more. If your palm's small, <laughs> you should eat a little less. Good <laughs> so, point. <laughs> it works, okay? <laughs> All right, the take home. Now I think you know that you can eat really, really delicious food, and you now, and you now have the tools uh, and make the, ha have the recipes that you're going to have for really happy, happy eating. Um, and uh, then again, okay, uh, where to buy my books? Uh, you can buy them online, Barnes & Nobles, Amazon, or any bookstore. That's great. And, again, your website is dinnerinminutes.com, but people don't go away because, again, let me mention the six recipes that are from your books. You're going to be emailing them tomorrow. And I'm, I'm all on top of that hot and spicy stir-fried beef. Love it. Love I it. Knew I, I, I knew you would be. I just knew you would be. I am. All right. So, listen, we've got a bunch of questions from our listeners. And before I get to that, let me also tell about one other very special thing from Bottom Line. So we've got a special report. So the food, to be able to conquer diabetes, you need to eat right. You need to eat healthfully. You need to know how to eat. But then there are other things also in terms of managing blood sugar and managing your blood sugar health. So my editors have put together a special report called Blood Sugar Breakthroughs. And in there are over 500 blood sugar lowering secrets that come straight from our, all of our top, top experts. So just some of the examples that are in this book. There's a vitamin that can actually lower your chances of developing diabetes in the first place by more than 30%. And I take that every single day. So does everyone in my family, quite frankly. Um, there's also actually, interesting, a debate that's going on that what traditionally was considered normal blood sugar isn't even healthy anymore. And the doctor doesn't necessarily tell you that. But the researchers, the, when you get into the research, that's when you find out these answers. And that's the kind of stuff that our experts are putting in this book. And here's another secret that I just love, that you can eat nuts to help you control your weight and even to prevent heart disease. So nuts used to be on the bad list, but, Linda, you and I both know that nuts are totally on the good list now. Right? And a great source of protein. Absolutely. Yep. So anyway, I think this book, in addition to all these great healthy eating tips and, how, and, and the recipes that we're going to get and all that they'll learn in your books, is this special report, Blood Sugar Breakthroughs, which gives you, as I said, great information that the doctor may or may not even be telling you. So I want to offer to everybody who's listening right now for 1995. As I said, 500 different secrets in there, and 1995 for what can be life-changing information. All you have to do to get this blood sugar breakthroughs book is look to the left side of the screen. There's a big orange button. We can't miss it because we like to make things big and orange, so you can't miss a thing. Anyway. Total satisfaction, 100% guaranteed. If you're not thrilled by the book, then just return it for a full money-back guarantee. Standard bottom line, Uber customer service, as always. No questions asked. So you can click that orange button whenever you want to. Um, while we're talking about the Q&As or as, once we're done, just that button will be there. So to get your copy of Blood Sugar Breakthroughs. So do that great, now. Great value. Great value. Terrific. Great value. And more importantly, life-saving stuff. You know, just one secret that changes Changes your, your life, changes your blood sugar, changes your health. Priceless, right? It's like the MasterCard exactly. commercial, priceless. Right, 
All right. Now we have some questions here. We do. So let's get to some questions. So I have a question from, who do I want to do? How about Sue from Dodgeville? Because everybody is a snacker, right? So what are some good snack choices? Well, you know, you just even mentioned one. How about some almonds or some pecans? Um, you know, you, what I do is I buy the shelf-stable ones in the market, um, and so they can be in my pocketbook or, or in your desk drawer or wh whatever, in your pocket, um, and take that as a snack. How about some um, a low-fat um, yogurt? It's a great filling snack for you. Uh, and, and so you can continue with things like that because you know for the American Diabetes Association, you need to have three meals and two snacks a day. See, so diabetes get to eat a lot, right? They eat Absolutely. All you want to have a steady flow of insulin throughout the day with, with, good, with good quality foods. Um, all right, and, so let me and, ask you an herb question. Yeah. Um, so fresh ahead. herbs, dry herbs. When do you use fresh and, and dry ones? Okay. You can, I always prefer fresh herbs. They're wonderful, delicious. Um, but of course you can't, you can't always get fresh herbs. So if a, if a recipe calls for, um, a quarter of a cup of fresh basil, or, or if, let's say oregano, well then you have a one teaspoon or two teaspoons. You have to cut it well back. And can I just tell you a few things about dried, uh, spices? Because sure. spices are different from the herbs. If your spices are, if you t it's been there more than six months and it looks kind of gray and sad, that's what it's going to taste like. It's time for a new one. Oh, no. <laughs> that's going to cost me a lot of money at home. <laughs> I know. So buy small amounts. Try to buy small jars. But, you know, you're spending a lot of money and effort in cooking with the food, so make it taste good. All right, so let me ask you this then, because we all have some of those spices that are hidden in the cabinet that we needed for one recipe and then we never use again. Like some of them that came to mind, marjoram, thyme, maybe dried mustard. So any suggestions on how to use some of those never used sure. spices? Sure. Well, you know, you can take the thyme and what was the marjoram and the yep. oregano, the three of those the Italian spices, and make yourself an Italian roast. So take uh, chicken, pork tenderloin, um, and, and then spray it with some olive oil spray and sprinkle those spices on top and roast it in your oven. You have a nice Italian meal. Great really idea. Simple. And I think the other thing that, you know, you said before, that don't be afraid to experiment. Right? Absolutely. Yep, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Let me just remind everybody, there's an orange, I called it a button, it's actually a rectangle on the screen in order to, to, in order, to order the special report on blood sugar. So, again, you can do that. Just click on that button anytime. You'll still be listening to Linda and me, so you'll get all of our goodness. All right. Um, Jennifer from Portland wanted to know about suggestions for vegetarians. Any, any yes. special suggestions for that? And that's and, and for veg, people who are vegetarians, they have to be a little more careful because they want to have a balanced meal. And it's really, really easy for people, uh, vegetarians, to have maybe a lot of cheese or something like that. Um, and you're going into the saturated fat area. So make your vegetables or have whatever meal you're going to have. And again, nuts are great protein uh, to put in. Maybe some avocado, another good vegetable protein. Um, Beans, you know, red beans or black beans. Um, those are all good suggestions. So make sure it's balanced, uh, and try not to have um, just you can. Uh, egg, egg is a wonderful protein. You know, one or two eggs. That's it. But don't overdo those saturated fats because that's that's what people find are easy to do if they're vegetarians. All right. So can you hang in for maybe one or two questions? I'm looking at the clock, but let's just get. <coughs> all right. One or go two ahead. What's the next one? All right, Elizabeth from Quebec wants to know about the best sugar substitute for using in baking. Okay. <clears throat> um, you know, that's a, 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 you can't say best because it depends on what you're making. For example, <clears throat> if you're making a cake or something like that, the sugar, real sugar, has CO2 in it, carbon. And so when that expands, it makes the cake lighter. So if you take it out, you're going to have a squishy, you know, bad bad uh, texture. So be careful about what you're doing, uh, what you're cooking. And, um, you know, now they have this Devia um, out, which is a more natural sugar substitute. Um, I baked with, uh, with the pink one. Um, I baked with the yellow one. Um, but it's hard to say which is the best one. Several of them have a mixture out of, of sugar plus the sweetener, so it's a, sort of a half and half. But read those labels because they're all different. 
Gotcha. All right. One last question, and this is my question, Linda, okay? Okay. What is, what is Linda Gassenheimer's go-to meal when you don't have time or ideas of what else to cook? Okay. So not only time and ideas, but you didn't have a chance to get out to the supermarket. Right. Exactly. What's your, the, oh, the God, I don't know what you, I'm going to do, but i got to cook dinner. Right. The weather you've been having these days, probably so. Anyway, I always keep frozen shrimp, or you can even have frozen shrimp, uh, frozen fish in my freezer. Uh, most of the shrimp you buy today is going to be frozen and defrosted in the market anyway. So buy, I keep it in my freezer. I keep some pasta, low-sugar pasta sauce on hand. I have some Parmesan cheese, and I can make, um, uh, you know, I can, I can cook up that shrimp. You know what I can do? Uh, here's an even better idea I'm thinking now. Salsa. Warm your salsa in the pan. Put the shrimp in it and let it cook in that salsa or even a piece of fish in the salsa. And then um, sprinkle some Parmesan cheese on top. You've got your vegetables, you've got your protein, and uh, maybe a piece of whole wheat uh, baguette or something, a small piece with it. That sounds fabulous. All right, well, Linda, I can't thank you enough. I can't thank everybody enough for joining us for our delicious diabetes dinners that everyone will love. Let me remind everybody three, three reminders. Number one, don't forget that if you want to order the Blood Sugar Breakthrough Special Report, with 500 secrets straight from the top experts in diabetes, health, and wellness, then you can do that right on the website there. There's just click on the orange rectangle, and you can order that special report. Number two, you can go to Linda's website, Dinner in Minutes, and you can check out all of her good information and learn more about her books, and you can order those. And watch your email tomorrow morning for those great, delicious recipes from Linda. All right, Linda Gassenheimer, thank you so very much. And this is Sarah Heiner from Bottom Line Publications. Great to be with you. Thank you.